Thank you very much. Um, so this is the first time I've given a talk like this to a non-Pearl crowd. Um, I think this is the first time I've had in, like, any interaction with the BCS. Maybe I'll hang around. It'd be cool. Um, so I hope it goes well. So today I'm going to be, I've been asked to talk about Pearl 6. I'm not going to. I'm going to talk about Raku. Um, what is Raku? Raku was Pearl 6. But about a month ago, there was various discussions and now they've decided to rename it Raku because there was a lot of confusion between the original Pearl, Pearl 5 and Pearl 6. Every other version of Pearl up until Pearl 5 was kind of backwards compatible. It wasn't too hard to move a Pearl 4 script to Pearl 5 and so on and so forth. But going from Pearl 5 to Pearl 6, a bit of a jump. It's been quite a long time to get there. So for whatever reason, it's now called Raku. I still have to train myself to call it Raku. I'll probably call it Pearl 6 a few times, but Raku. So what is Raku? Um, so under the hood, first thing to, about Raku is it is a set of spec tests. Raku is defined as a, as a test suite. If you can write something that passes the Raku test suite, you've written Raku. It's not... Um, like a specific compiler or anything right now. There is only one kind of stable version at the moment, but there could be multiple ones as long as you pass the test suite. Um, the stable one is made up of Rakudo, which is a compiler, um, compiles uh, Raku scripts on the fly into bytecode that can then be run by a VM. Uh, there's three VMs that it can target, but generally only one of them is the one you're going to be using. Um, and that one is, oh yeah, I quite like this one, the fact that Rakudo is 92% written in Raku. So as they make the language faster, the compiler gets faster, just straight up, which is quite fun. Um, the main target for Rakudo is more VM, uh, short for meta model on a runtime. Um, it's a object-based threaded VM. I'm, I'm more of a code with this compiler stuff is slightly over my head, but it's optimized for Raku. Garbage collected, um, has got some really lovely little sneaky things in it. Like it's got one thread that just runs watching your code as it's happening and looks for uh, hot code. So if it says, well, this function seems to be getting run quite a lot and you haven't given it a type, but every time you've called it with an integer, maybe I'll just swap in a version that just expects an integer and runs that a little bit faster because it's not going to be checking at the beginning what you've passed it. Um, yeah, there's some quite impressive stuff uh, if, if you're interested in compiler architecture. Some, uh, Jonathan Wor Worthington has written some stuff about more VM. Most of it, like I say, goes over my head, but it is quite interesting to read. There are a couple of other targets. Uh, the code runs differently well on both of them. Uh, there's JVM, some of you may have heard of, the Java Virtual Machine. Hello, hello. Uh, yeah, I will. I will put the slides up. I'll make them available at the end. Not a problem. Yes, totally. Um, yes, JVM. Uh, I'm sure everybody's heard of this one. Uh, like I say, because the more VM specifically geared towards Raku JVM, there's a few things that don't work on it quite as well. Uh, and there's Rakudo JS, which I just think is hilarious. And what that will do is it will take your Raku code and it will compile it into a 10 meg um, JavaScript file that will then run on a browser. Um, the interesting thing being is that even Hello World is 10 meg because it basically compiles everything in. One of the things that they're looking at when the, the guy was, who was working on it was doing it, it was like a Google Summer of Code thing, and he's looking to pick it up again at some point. And one of the things he's looking at doing is adding in tree shaking to basically go, well, you're not using this bit, so I'll throw it away. So eventually it might compile down to smaller JavaScript, but right now it's a toy, it's kind of funny. Uh, so, what kind of programming paradigms does Raku support? Well, functional programming, yep, it's functional programming stuff is amazing, you can do great things with it. I was reminded today that it's got a compose operator, so you can pass it two functions and it will compose them together and give you a new function just straight up, that's lovely. Um, you've got assuming, which basically lets you carry functions. Um, functions are first class objects, you can pass them around, you can do all kinds of stuff with them. It's great. On the other hand, it is also fully object oriented. Everything is an object, like everything. The <clears throat> description of uh, more VM where it's like meta model, this is because a subroutine is an object which has a capture 
uh, a signature object which defines the signature of the subroutine and uh, you know you can you can drill into your subroutines and, and like use the meta model to look at how they work so if you really want to write heavily object oriented code with lots of um, inheritance source kind of stuff then you can totally do it or you can just be passing data between functions and that works just as well you've got a full set of immutable um, data structures that you can use to make sure that your your codes all lovely and, and safe so that's nice uh, do you want to have a nice procedural code so it starts at the top goes through all that kind of stuff yeah great awesome or event-based um you can write it's got built-in support to be able to easily write event-based code um last year for the uh, pearl six as it was then advent calendar i in the space of a day went from having no idea what i was going to write because everybody kept stealing my idea before i wrote the article to writing a um gnome dice rolling thing so i could basically press a button and it would roll some dice uh in impulse x in a day having never done it before and it's all event based because you press the button that triggers an event and stuff that's how easy it was i'll cover some of how i did that during the talk all of these can be done you can you can write pulse it around it rock around it. see see what i said <laughs> um pearl 5 or pearl has often been called the swiss army chainsaw of programming languages Raku is a chainsaw building language. You can build the chainsaw that you need for the job that you're going to do. Um, it's very, very easy to extend. It's very, very easy to add operators. It's very, very easy to build DSLs in Raku and build the language that you want to use. One of the reasons I really like it. So I like this slide. It, it blows some people's minds at times. Um, so Raku is a typed language. It has a Boolean type, so true, false, these are Boolean types, lovely. But there are other things that can be true things. Um, it's dynamic language, so there are a number of things that are considered true. One is considered true. An array with more than one element in, or one or more elements in, is true. All these things, a string that isn't a blank string is true. That's great. You know, that's, that's same, same as Perl, same as PHP, same as lots and lots of languages. Um, you don't have to specifically worry about coercing things. That's true. That that lovely little bit of floating point math that will blow up quite a lot of languages because they go, no, 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 this is 0 0.00003 something. Um, Raku under the hood uses rational numbers. I'll come back to that in a bit. I quite like that. That's true. You can, if you put that into a Raku uh, REPL or like put that into some code, it will evaluate that and it'll go, well, yes, one is less than three. Three is greater than two. That's true. You, you can chain operators, and the language knows how to handle that. So it doesn't, because in some languages, what this would do is go, one is less than three, okay, that evaluates the true. So now I'll evaluate true is greater than two, true is one, so one is greater than two, so that's false, but that's true. I like that. On that note, for on the chaining of operators, that's really annoying. Sorry, I didn't spot this. Uh, that's another couple of Unicode characters. Or in, in this case, all of these characters are Unicode numeric literals, which means that they're flagged as being digits. And you can use them to generate number, li number literals. You don't have to coerce them. So if you want to work in a, a language which uses a decimal, it's like, so like, yeah, decimal based, like, or base 10 even, numeric system, you can just write them. And again, it's chaining them all. There is one there, but it didn't work when I converted it to a PDF, apparently. Joy, or this laptop doesn't have it on the font. That's also possibly it. I don't know. Probably the second one. Um, I just kind of like that. But yeah, it, it's Unicode is like that low level that what it can do with Unicode. It's built from the ground up to understand and use Unicode. Um, and finally, zero but true. Now this, this is, a, we're, we're using some object composition here. So I'm taking a zero integer object and then I'm composing onto it the fact that if you want the Boolean representation of it, return true instead of what would normally be false. That's what the but is doing. Um, this, this comes from a thing way back in the Perl 5 database thing, DBI. If you did a select and there were no results, it had to be able to send you it, it returned one value, which is the number of results. But 
if it failed, it had to return false. So what it did is if it was no results, but it had the, the, the thing had succeeded, it would return zero to times 10 to the power zero. So zero E zero, which Perl five evaluates true. And everybody calls that zero, but true. But in Perl, in Raku, you can just write zero, but true, which is cool. I like that. What was next? Oh yeah, objects. Uh, yeah, so as I said earlier, Everything in uh, Raku is built on objects. Uh, by default, they are immutable. Um, so if you create a new object, you have to put a little bit of work in, not a huge amount of work, but a little bit of work in to make your objects mutable. Um, this is really useful if you're playing around with threads. If you're throwing uh, data between threads, you, you don't want that data to change because everything can look at it. Um, you can either build objects using lovely big inheritance trees, or you can use composition using what is uh, uh, what is called roles, which are a kind of combination of mixing and uh, what's the other word I was looking for? Did I write it up there? I didn't. Interfaces. Yes, I did write it up there. Great, because my sometimes my brain turns off. Um, you've also got subsets. I love subsets. I've, just, I've got a subset here. So I'm saying um, a small integer is an integer that's less than 50. Now, this magic star. You, you may see this a lot if you're looking at Raku code. What that does, when the, when the compiler's reading it, it gets to this point, it goes, well, here, where is expecting a, a subroutine? It's expecting a function. Instead, you're giving me a star. So the star knows that I should be a function. So it creates a function here that's accepting one argument because there's one star, and then it, this function then will return true. So it's just a nice little syntactic way of writing that without having to write the whole function creation code. Um, but then that means I've now got a type, small int, that I can use when I'm calling a, a function to type check that. So this, this function here, foo, will error if you call it with an integer greater than 100. It'll also error if you call it with a non-integer value, because I've now typed it to say it needs a small int. Um, depending on how you define that, it'll be either compile time or runtime error. It can pick up on that kind of thing. Uh, other, other little thing to note here, you've got the Smart quotes around the star, that totally works in uh, Raku. This makes life really easy when you're writing slides because you don't have to go back and change all of the quotes after your slide uh, editor turns them into smart quotes because uh, Raku knows those are quotes, so they're allowed. There's about, I think, 26 different types of quotes that you can use in Raku. It's kind of crazy uh, at times. Um, uh, well, it. it it's based on the Unicode rules. So the Unicode, like basically the Unicode table knows that these two quotes are the either side of the same thing. So Raku goes, those two quotes are the either side of the same thing. Great. Um, the X there, just the uh, operator basically repeats this that many times and makes a string of that value. In case anybody was wondering what the foo subroutine did. Um, no, that, I'm going the wrong way. There we go. Okay. Some code. So, Two, two of the things I really like about uh, Raku are its multi-dispatch and its signatures. Now, here we have a, a pretty standard function that's like been living in some code for a little while. So it's got a comment. Now, just a little note about this comment. Uh, the bar after this thing. So what that does is it attaches the comment to the code below. So if you look into this code using the meta, um, meta model, that comment is available. Um, if this is actually used when you're making command line scripts, it will generate the usage of your command line script based on the comments you've attached to uh, the various parts of it. That can be really helpful. Also, it can be helpful if you're using an IDE and the IDE knows what these, like, can inspect the code. Um, yeah, so I thought I'd throw that one in. Uh, so we're, we're checking to see that we've got a defined user. We're checking to see we've been given some preferences and we're dying. If not, die is the Perl. Uh, Perl 5 and Raku way of throwing an exception. Uh, though in Raku, it is actually throwing an exception rather than Perl 5, which just kind of stops. Uh, um, then we've got a little comment that we've got a thing here because calling the preferences maybe does a web call or something. So there's some overhead to it. So we want to avoid doing it if we don't have to. You know, this is, we've all seen code like this before, where it's like a bunch of lines of, of boilerplate just to make sure that the the, the line that's actually important, like, doesn't explode or take too long. So first thing we can do is we can get rid of those, those die t 
tests at the top. By adding this multi command to the front of our subroutine, we've now defined it three times. Mm. And there's not there's lots of languages that do that. Um, and but rather than a lot of the cases languages I've seen which allow you to do this, you can only do it based on like the number of elements passed in. Whereas in Raku, it's as long as each signature is different, it will work out which one you want to do. So in this case, I'm saying I want uh, anything that's undefined. Um, because I don't care what it is, I'm not giving, I'm just saying it's a scalar. Dollar just means it's a, it's a scalar object, and this is an array, but I don't care. I'm not going to use it, so I'm not going to give it a name, and then I'm going to die. Here I'm saying if I'm given a user, um, and I'm given a preferences list. Now, again, I've used the where thing. I didn't create a full subset. That that basically just um, is checking that the preference, if the preference is empty by, because preferences list will be false if it's empty. So that's checking for true. So then we die there. And, immediate, and already my main subroutine, the one I care about, has got smaller. Great. Love it. Um, of course, if I change my no preferences supplied error to require a defined user and change my main thing to require a defined user, I can get rid of the first one. Now, it's just going to, the, the, the runtime itself will go, well, you've called with an undefined user or, or an undefined something else. I don't know what to do. I will throw a standard compiler error. So brilliant. Less lines of code. This is what we like to see. Now, uh, the dot, dot, dots is a, that's, that's the code that I just showed so I can make some space. Uh, so now, we what happens if I've been called and... I don't have a user preference, then I'll just return. So I'm moving that code that was checking to see if the user had preference again into the signature. So it's done at, it's done at call time. And now my main subroutine is down to one line, down to the actual line that counts. There's a lot more you can do with the multi sub things. Well, the final thing is like I said, I can set up a subset for this. And now that code's just that little bit easier to read. Like I say, there is a lot more you can do with this to allow you to basically swap things around in lots of interesting interesting ways. Um, one of the things I find quite, it, I mentioned command line scripting earlier. One of the uh, built-in things is if you have a subroutine called main in capital letters, that will take in your command line arguments so you can run a command line script. And if you make it a multi-sub, you can basically create these nice big command line scripts that do all kinds of things, things like git and all that kind of stuff could be written by just having a series of mains. I do that quite a lot when I'm playing around with posits. Raku, bad time. <laughs> OK, junctions. Um, so I define here an array, with three false values in. And then I define three things. One's called an all, one's called a none, and one's called an any. And these are what are called junctions. So junction, um, as is described, is a, a, yeah, it's a quantum superposition of states. Until you look in the junction by testing it for truthiness, um, it will hold all its possible values. So when I do this, so the dot so um, method is basically the Boolean coercer. So when I coerce all three of these, uh, then I get that the all array is false because then they're not all true. Uh, the none array is true because they're not all true. And the any array is false because not, not none of them are true. OK, with me so far. Now I change the first value to true, and I do that again. And now my first two are still false, but my third one's now become true because one of them, any of them, is true. Um, so that's, that's one sort of demonstration of junctions. Here's another little one I've thrown up here. So you can also use these operators to define junctions. Now, last time I did this, I, I ran through this talk at work and someone said to me, oh, aren't these bitwise manipulation operators? And I said, well, in most languages, yes, but because bitwise manipulation is not something you're generally going to be doing in Raku, it's not one of its strengths. You can do it, but generally you're going to be wanting to do something else. And junctions are much more fun. So bitwise operators in uh, Raku are now two characters long because we wanted to use these for junctions. Anyway, <laughs> so here, this is evaluating to true because one of these values is less than four, or four is less than one of these values. Also, two is, or one of these values is less than two. Again, chained operators. Yeah, so that one's true. 
This one is true because any of them fulfills the thing. The last one is false because not all of them fulfill the, the criteria. I ran, I wrote a, one of the, well, one of the first modules I wrote um, checks Sudoku puzzles to see if they've been solved correctly and it uses junctions to do it. Just basically sets up massive big junctions. Sorry. Hello, hello. Yes. Yeah. Twice, one through the side. So this is the thing, you see. So you've got to imagine that it is a, it is a, it's a single thing. And it, yes, in, if you imagine it's this, this one gets evaluated first, and that's true. And that one gets evaluated, and that's true. So it's true. It's fine. It's true for both cases. Quantum superposition. <laughs> yeah, try, to, try not to put expressions that are side effect in junctions. That's, that's a cruel thing to do to any junction. Promises. Um, so, Pulse 6 has, uh, has got a lot of uh, support for concurrent and parallel processing. And one of these is promises, which allows you to, uh, for instance, here we'll create a promise, which was the, using the start um, keyword which then runs this block, which goes to sleep for three and then prints something. Uh, my second promise uh, works in slightly different ways, uses the promise object and the in um, uh, method to create a promise that fires in uh, two seconds. And then once that's completed, prints the second one. This third one, third one waits till any of the first two promises are completed and prints its third line. This last one uh, waits till all three of these are printed and does its last one. And then we'll start the thing. And here we await. Um, so now we await and wait for all four of my promises to finish. Uh, if you've done stuff with uh, some other languages that have a wait in, you may notice that I haven't used the word async anywhere because they were like, why do we need async? Um, and when you run that, you end up with this, with some pauses in the middle. It takes a little while, three seconds, funnily enough. We also have channels and supplies. Uh, so you have channels, which are, yeah, first in, first out messaging that can pass messages between threads. Uh, one of the nice things I quite like with them is that you can get a channel that you can then split into other channels and you can apply um, things like map and filter and reduce, well, not reduce, but you can, so you can filter the data. So you can have sort of data comes into one channel and then it gets sent out to different ones, but with only certain parts of the data coming off. And then you can have code on the ends reading off that those channel data. That's quite fun. Um, and wherever you're, you're dealing with a, any kind of message bus or, or messaging queue, channels just fit into that. If you're dealing with a queuing system, then you just make it work like make it look like a channel or make it produce a channel, and then everything in Raku just goes, "Hey, I know what to do with that." Uh, supplies is the event side of things. So a supply um, will you put an event into it and anything that is wired up to it at the point when you put the event in will handle it and you can have code that fires off when it happens. You've also got um, a very nice uh, thing called a react whenever block. That is a block that's just designed to handle concurrent programming to, because it does burn the brain a bit. Now, I'm not going to go into it in too much more detail because there is a much better talk about it that was given a few months ago at the Pearl Conference in Riga. Uh, and I've got a link to it at the end of the slides and you, I'll give you all a copy. Um, it was done by Jonathan Worthington, who's the lead developer on the More VM. It's really good. If you've got any interest in like um, parallel and concurrent programming and he shows a, an actual live case of some code he's been working on for the government in wherever he lives, I can't remember now. Um, where they cut, cut it down by 80% the speed it was taking to do stuff by just taking something that was running sequentially and turning it um, concurrent with only a few lines of code changes. It's quite impressive. So that's why I'm not gonna go into it anymore, but it's really good. Uh, <laughs> I mentioned earlier, again, I go round and round in circles in these talks, that it's got Unicode built into its very soul, its DNA. So here I'm defining two variables. Now you'll note that I'm using a acute as a variable name because why not? It's a letter, so I can use it as a variable name. Uh, in the first case, I'm using the 
uh, the named Unicode character syntax to define a small a acute. In the second case, I'm using the combining acute uh, Unicode character. Now, in a lot of languages, if you pass them these two strings, like from a file, they would consider them to be different things. But app L6 is fine. Prints them out. Yep. Uh, Test that they're the same. This is the smart match operator that kind of works out what kind of matching, whether it should be matching based on strings or numbers or some other thing based on what's on either side of it. It's quite powerful. But yes, it's saying, yeah, these are the same thing. Great. Um, and you can do uppercase and it correctly uppercases them. A lot of languages that have had Unicode bolted on after the fact won't be able to do that. Not all, I mean, some of them, some of them can. I'm not gonna, I'm not dissing anybody, but I'm just saying, I think that's quite cool. This next bit is a bit silly. <laughs> yeah, that works. Um, that X there, by the way, is not is not the X. That's the mathematical multiplication Unicode operator, which I wouldn't use that normally. Normally, I just use the star because, like I say, stars do everything in in, uh, in Raku. But I just wanted to use it for this demonstration. So I do that. Uh, then I tell it to say it, and uh, say just is um, print with a new line, uh, and it and it gives us it's 2.25 because it is, it's kind of fun. Um, that annoys me. I, I missed that, but anyway. Uh, and then I uppercase it, and it correctly uppercases the. I can't remember the name of this thing, but it. Hmm? Is it? Yes. I looked it up and everything. Uh, it correctly uppercases it into double S which I thought was kind of cool. Uh, but yeah, this is very silly. I mean, I'm not saying you should, occasionally, you know, using the three quarters sim things and the, and the square can be good. It can make your code more readable to people, but it's, it's your choice. You don't have to use them. It's not, it's not a requirement. There is a, there is a to the power of operator and you can just use that. You can write everything you want in ASCII, but if you want to use Unicode, it's there. Uh, I'll just throw this one in here. Sorry, it's not much left, honest. Um, so, sequences, lady of valuations. Uh, so here we, I'm defining uh, a range. So one dot dot star. In this case, the star, uh, as I said, stars, magical. Um, in this case, it knows that it needs a number. So in this case, it needs, oh, well, if you give me a star at the end of a range, that's infinity. So this is saying from one to infinity, give me a range from one to infinity. Now, luckily, lazy. So it goes, okay, fine. And then I'm grepping it. So this array, is an array, it's a lazy range that I can pull stuff off as I go along. Um, this is a, a sequence. Sequences will look at the values you give them. Well, they work in two ways. The first way is you give them some values and then they look at them and work out, is this a geometric or the other one, ar arithmetic? Well, progression, adding or multiplying. Um, <laughs> works out what progression it is and then gives you that and you can then treat it as an array. Or you can give it a code block. And again, we've got magic stars. So this one, this, because there's two, it goes, okay, this, so I'm gonna have a, uh, a block that's expecting two uh, input values and I'll add them together. So that will give you the Fibonacci sequence. What's really funny is that star, star, star works as long as there's spaces between them because it knows that the middle one can't be a magic star because you've got to have an operator. So it knows it's multiplication. Bonkers. Does, it's not very good when you start with one and one, but it's quite good if you've got like one, two and stuff. <laughs> oh, and then we have, uh, yeah, if you run a division by zero, it's fine. Like I say, it does rational numbers and it doesn't worry about them until you try and stringify them. So you can have a, 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 a rational number for quite a while until you try and print it out, at which point it goes, I don't know what to do, it explodes. Um, and then you can use the someone was having a laugh at this point. You can use the nude method or numerator and denominator. I'd like to point out there is also a numerator and a denominator method, but to mix them together, of course, it has to be nude uh, to get the two values. So you can peek in and see, yes, this rational number actually exists and has a denominator of zero. Great. I don't think you can set them because that would get weird. Anyway, uh, using these, we should look at sets of max. Um, Though mostly sets. It's got a complete stuff of set theory, basically. Uh, so here I'm defining my primes again. Here's my Fibonacci, except for that's not Fibonacci, Simon. That should be a one. Sorry. 
uh, set of primes uh, using the, yeah, I've already said that. Um, so now I'm saying, you know, what's the, uh, is this in that using the element, uh, sorry, I'm getting tired, <laughs> using the element operator. Uh, and in this case, I'm saying, you know, give me the uh, intersection between these two sets. And that prints out all of this. Hello. Uh, at the point where I asked for them. So that would be at that point. Um, and again, with the Fibonacci's, that would be the point where the first first 11, because again, yeah, you're right. Um, and yes, there are also ASCII versions of all the set operators, but there is a complete set of set operators. Yes, yeah. Because, it, it, no, so... It's, so what happens is that at this point here, so prime set is a set, but the fib is a, an array. But as we say here, set operators coerce their arguments to a set. So what this does is it turns that into a set and then does the set operation between them and then returns the set of the results. So yes, you can't, um, there's, there's some things you can't do with it. I have actually been working on a, uh, a module to let you do um, set operations between ranges where it doesn't blow the range up into uh, into lists and then apply the operation um, to allow you to do like um, ranges with uh, decimals at either end, so like 1.2 to 10.7 and not lose the bits in between. Because currently if you try doing that, you can, but that's the idea that you can call this thing in and then you can do to see the intersections, mostly for date times. Because I think that's quite useful. Because you can do a date time range and then you can look at the intersections between them. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That at the point when you when you want to do something with it, we put it into a set. You need to give it some actual values so it yeah gets those gets those values. Um, you can, but probably doesn't do what you want it to do. So if you use a range operator with decimals until you turn it into a list, it does actually, you can, you, it does actually consider it to be that range. This is part of the problem I have with it. But once you try to start doing anything listy with it, it tries to turn it. So if you had 1.2 to 10.7, as soon as you try and do anything listy with it, it turns it into 1.2, 2.2, 3.2, 4.2, 5.2, which isn't what I would generally want for that range. But like I say, working on that. Uh, so this is my one image. Sorry, I'm terrible for images. I, I, I'm a words guy, so words. Um, so this code here made that image using this Cairo uh, library. But here's the thing, right? Uh, there's a couple of right to ping, I think, and rectangle. Now have a look at these two. This is the code that creates the right to ping method. That is it. I have this star is not, this star is just a placeholder. There is no... I've not hidden, I've not deleted code or anything. That is the code. Because this is native is the magic. It's using Cairo lib, which is either the string lib Cairo 2 or Cairo v2, depending on if you're on uh, Linux or Windows. Um, so this is basically using the Cairo shared object and just pulling in the function from that. Um, and then same, same for this one. Note that it's renaming it there. This is really powerful. This allows you to basically use any C library that you've got. And this is how easy it is to just pull the code in and start using that C library. You don't have to go off and write crazy stuff. That's that's it. I really like that. Uh, yeah, there is load of other stuff. <laughs> I'll quickly go through these. It's got a grammar system that it uses to pass itself. Um, and that you can modify on the fly using things called slangs to add additional stuff to the language. Um, so Perl 5's regular expressions are very powerful. If you've ever used them, you'll know you can do quite a lot with them. Raku grammars blow those out the water and allow you to like do fully like create full abstract, abstract syntax trees and stuff. It doesn't matter any numbers. Yeah, who doesn't? Uh, it's actually got exceptions and exception handling and all this kind of stuff. Um, with uh, the blah, 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 words I was gonna use, like I say, Perl 5 doesn't really. Um, interestingly, it actually uses exceptions for control flow as well. So when you're in a loop, if you leave the loop early, it uses what's called a control exception to work out 
um, like where to go back to and stuff. So it's using the, the same exception system for, for, the, for all the ways you bounce around within the code, which I thought was quite interesting. Um, it links into CPAN, which is the uh, Perl uh, module network. So you can upload Raku modules to CPAN and then download them from there. There's another place you can put them as well, but that's kind of useful. Like say, meta objects, it's got this massive amount of meta object stuff. Uh, the telemetry stuff's quite interesting. Um, you can you can put in some code points and then check out how fast your code's going. That was just something I remember. I mean, I'm calling out IO notification here because I quite like that one. You can point at, a, at a, a path and it will fire up notification events when that path changes. So quite useful for if you're wanting to do like FTP stuff. All this is built in to the language. You don't have to like import anything special or anything. Uh, date times built in. I did a check. Yeah, there's 317 built in types. Some of, many of which are exceptions. Um, but, but yeah, it's, it's so much in there. Um, so I've really just kind of like given you a really big overview because there's just so much of it. Um, and, and as you may have guessed, I quite like it. Uh, here are some links. Again, I will share these. This will be put online also. The files kicking around and stuff. So you don't have to look into now. This, this, this URL here is the one that I mentioned about the talk. It's really, really good. Um, there's some, but yeah, there's some other stuff in there. Uh, and that's it. So any more questions? I think, how are we done for time? Not too bad. Hello, hello. Uh, we'll do the back and then I'll, so, yes. Yeah. Um, it's just the, you actually don't need to, you don't need to use sub if you're using multi, um, but it's just the, for the, the, because of the grammar system. Um, the grammar system doesn't, because it uses the grammars to part this, as I understand it, uses the grammars to pass the code. Um, and it, the, one of the things with the grammars is it doesn't do look back. So if you, if you define the sub and then you define it again, if you hadn't defined the first one as a multi, it goes, you've already defined this and throws an error. It can't kind of go back and tell it that the first one's a multi because that would involve backtracking. So some of the choices are to, to remove the need for backtracking during the grammar passing, I believe. But I could be wrong. <laughs> but that one sounds like, what's it enough? Hello. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, so if you're reading a file, you can you can basically tell it to store it in that way and to output in that way. So if the data you got was like that, you can and if you want to create it like that and then output it like that, you can do that. And you can you can there's specific ways you can get it to like keep that encoding and print it out like that. Um, but it, it, the, it generally errs on the side of if you're reading in a bunch of text, you want it to be, you know, in a, in a standard format. But yeah, this is, this is, I, I, there's some articles on this. Actually, someone's written some things about this because they had a thing where they, they pulled in a file, wrote it out again, and the file got smaller and they're like, what happened? It's because it had some combining acute. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah um so this this is a conversation that i've been having with my boss on a number of occasions so i think there's a few um areas that it is really strong and will be stronger in the future and will be more useful in the future which is uh firstly it's unicode support like i say if you're having to deal with unicode at all it's unicode support is brilliant um, so that may be enough. Uh, it's grammars are really powerful. So if you're doing things involving having to do file processing, like big uh, files, um, I, like I say, I just touched them with one, one line, but they are very, very powerful. So, um, and built directly into the language. So they're for like fully programmable grammars. Um, and it's, it's concurrency and parallelism. It's threading architecture. Um, it, you know, it's got promises built in, but when you fire those off, they're, they're running on separate threads and stuff. It will make use of as many threads as it can within your 
within your architecture. Like I say, with its own, it's got a couple of its own running in the background as well, doing garbage collection and stuff. But those are areas that I think that it really excels in the ability to write threaded code that isn't brain melting um, and really, really powerful. So those are the areas I think it's worth really having a look at. But also, it's just quite fun. Uh, <laughs> that's that's why I started with it because I'm starting to go and I'm like, what you can you can do you can do this and that's the Fibonacci series and all this kind of stuff. Anybody else? I'll wind down then. <laughs> Thank you very much.